some uh, seats up front if anybody's standing in the back or wants to get a little closer there's people actually outside waving to us that's great all righty it got so quiet so quickly all right well welcome everyone my name is Lenny Cohen I'm Cap Gemini's chief technology and innovation officer and it's a real honor to have you all here tonight uh, there's a small event going on up the street today and all week, so we appreciate you chose us over that. So thanks again for being here. Um, how many first timers in the crowd? We always love to ask this question. Wow, quite a bit. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Capgemini, we're a global consulting technology and outsourcing firm. Um, and uh, what you're sitting in now is our Applied Innovation Exchange. It's one of 11 we have around the world, and we help clients get the benefits out of applying innovation at speed and scale safely and with a high degree of uh, certainty. So I've got a lot of colleagues in the room walking around, so when we're done, please seek them out. They'll tell you all about Capgemini and all about the uh, AIE. Uh, and for those of you who have been here before, a big thanks to you for your patronship and, uh, and being uh, such a, a great set of collaborators over the past uh, year and a half or so. Uh, last Monday night, we uh, took what's now on the road and did our first launch of what's now in New York last week uh, with Steven Johnson. And it was a, uh, yeah, thanks. It was a great success, uh, great turnout, and uh, we're looking forward to that program. Uh, excuse me. Uh, oh, <laughs> Steven thanks you as well. Uh, but it was, a, it was a great success, great turnout, and we look forward to a great run uh, there as well. Tonight's an incredibly special night. Uh, Tim O'Reilly's with us again, and Tim's just become a huge fan and friend of the AIE, and, uh, and we're doing Tim's book launch tonight, so we're incredibly grateful for that. Uh, after the event, uh, the garage door to my right and behind most of you is gonna open, and we've got food trucks out in the street, so you'll be able to gorge yourself with some of San Francisco's finest cuisine, I'm sure. Uh, but you're welcome to stick around uh, for, for a long time after the event. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, from reInvent Pete Lydon, who's been uh, one of the main people who's made AIE such a success and uh, what's now uh, such a great program. Pete? Thank you, yeah, Pete, I'm Pete Lydon. I'm the founder of reInvent, which is a media company which the way we think about it, we're always trying to figure out a better way forward. And we do that by tapping into different kind of innovators in different fields, in deep conversations, teasing out always what can be done to move the ball forward. How can we actually really keep moving towards, towards a better world? And this whole series, What's Now San Francisco, kind of falls in that space, which is what we've been doing for the last 18 months is we go to a different field every month. We take some innovator in that really gets what's going on. And they come and explain what's happening that's really important in that field, uh, what's important in that field, and basically how it's going to impact all kinds of other fields, if not the country as a whole. Uh, every time we also do this is we actually gather an innovative crew like yourself to actually be part of this conversation. It's not just a conversation with that one innovator, it's a conversation with all of you. And over the course of the last 18 months, we've built up this multidisciplinary uh, network, which has been really, really kind of interesting. It's made for deeper and deeper conversations. One backdrop of all these conversations, as we step back and look at the last year and a half, is that everybody's trying to nudge the, doing that kind of conversation about how do we essentially find a better way forward? A better way forward for that field, a better way forward for the economy, a better way forward for the country, the world, however you want to frame it. 
And so today, at the end of the, we're almost at the end of the year here, 2017, we've got the perfect person to tie together this series in a different way, Tim O'Reilly. And one of the reasons is Tim is essentially a big picture guy. Tim has so much street cred in so many different spaces that he's really one of the few folks that can really pull back from all these different subfields and start to connect the dots and talk in a bigger picture. The other thing about Tim, which has been really interesting over his career, is he's always infused his work with a real set of deep values. He really cares about moving the ball forward, trying to make that better, b the better way forward towards a kind of better world. And so with his book, which is an awesome book, which just has come out, he really is putting some big ideas and some really high bars there for what the tech community, the innovative kind of economy community, the country at large, business in general, can actually, how we really step up and make a kind of future which we really want to live in. Not just from people in the barrier, but across the country, across the world. And, uh, and so we're really going to be lucky to have a deep conversation with him at that level. Now, the really interesting, fortuitous part about this, this is a book party. This is his official book party, and in fact, Bloomberg Beta here with James Chan is, is a co-host of this party as well, um, <laughs> providing some of the books here that you've had. It's a book party and it's a celebration of the book. But what's really interesting about this is this comes on the back of Foo Camp. Foo Camp, which is the Friends of O'Reilly Camp, is about for the last 15 years or so, Tim has essentially gathered every year a collection, again, a multidisciplinary collection of all these innovators from different fields to take on a topic that's really interesting and important and have people discuss it in a kind of unconference way. It just happened this weekend, just over at the Lyft headquarters here, came, ended at midnight on uh, Saturday night. And there's folks here from that I can see. I was also privileged to be there. And we're able to actually talk about what went on in that space. Because in that space, there was a really robust conversation about how do we come to terms with the power of the platform economy? How do we start to really fundamentally think about shaping the impact of that platform economy, but also start to retool the fundamentals of the general economy itself? And it really was a deep and profound e conversation and one that I think we're going to squeeze out some of the insights from that weekend as well in this first conversation, coming off that private kind of group to actually this public forum, doing it on video, opening it up to conversation with you. And with that, let's bring Tim up to start this conversation. Hey. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Why don't you sit over here? Right. Uh, look, you're trying to get me liquored up, so I'll, my tongue will be. That open. was not. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. All right. He we'll gets water, I get wine. That's something. <laughs> that, uh, we want to get you on the record on a few things here. Yeah. No, no, All no. Right. Very friendly conversation here. Um, Tim, before we get to it, I want to lay this out and lay the pieces here so that we can later have engage all you out there. You've been ahead of the curve. You've got street cred on being ahead of the curve of the early web with GNN, yeah. which is the Global Network Navigator, kind of figuring out that early. And you were early on open source, kind of snuffing that out and seeing how important that was. You were early on the Web 2.0 phenomenon. In fact, helped reframe the whole narrative of Web 2.0. You were early in the Web 2.0 government thing. So you've always been early to these kind of emerging big transformations. Yeah. What? Just, can you tell us, how do you do that so consistently? Is there any kind of little formula here that you can kind of pass on some, some help of, of how do you get in that space all the time? Uh, I guess the first thing I would say is uh, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there's this great quote from William Gibson, which I think I'm the person who made famous. I heard it on the radio, I think. Uh. And uh, I started repeating it so often it kind of went into common parlance. It's the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And so the first thing that I try to do, and this really, the, 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 uh, the first part of the book is called How to Think About the Future, and it really does go into some of the history, but also some of the techniques I've used. A lot of it has to do with simply paying attention and noticing things that are left out of the narrative. Because basically, the world is, as we experience it is shaped by what we already believe. And so the first thing you have to notice is, wait a minute, this, the map doesn't actually match what I'm seeing. You know, you guys know that. You, if you follow in Google Maps and you go, wait a minute, that road is closed. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, we also know the story of people who followed Google Maps and the bridge wasn't there and they drove into the canal. 
uh, because they weren't really paying attention to the road, they were just paying attention to the map. And so a lot of what I've tried to do is simply say, hey, there's something going on here and we're not quite, you know, it's not reflected in the map. So a really good example of this was back in, you, know, you mentioned open source software. Uh, you know, there was a whole narrative about free software that involved only the Linux operating system because that was familiar. Everybody knew uh, what, uh, you know, was happening with Microsoft and operating systems on PCs. But I said, wait a minute, all the internet is built on open source or free software as well. And so adding that to the narrative gave us a completely different story. But more recently, just think about this, in 2005, we knew what the connected taxi cab was. You put a screen in the back and you showed ads, right? Everybody knew what that was, and, and, you know, because that's what you did with the internet. Uh, and, and along, you know, a few, only a few years later, we realized, oh, actually, you could match up passengers and drivers in real time using the sensors in their phones. And so the future actually is happening all along. This is great line, I didn't use this in the book, but I've thought about it since. This is a great line from Ernest Hemingway in uh, The Sun Also Rises, where one character uh, is asked, uh, you know, how did you go bankrupt, Mike? And he says, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you think about the future, that's a lot how it happens. So, you know, and things, you know, just take climate change as an example. It's happening gradually, then suddenly, you know, we're suddenly going to wake up, and you know, it was, but it's also in a smaller scale. You know, this evolution. I trace, for example, how all of the pieces came together into what we now think of as Lyft and Uber. You know, but it was a gradually, then suddenly kind of uh, of experience. So, right, so, so you so just so notice that things are changing. You you try to pay attention. Okay, yeah. so you've been paying attention, and you've called. Mm -hmm. Essentially yeah. what your book is about yeah. is you're now crystallizing a yeah. kind of a different yeah. insight into what's really going right. on with the platform economy and That's the right. disruption to our larger economy. Yeah. So why don't you explain to folks is what is your yeah. couple of insights there that are really well, quite profound? Well, I, I think the core of this book I is really around the idea that what's happening today is, uh, it's really two things. We're building a set of companies that are platforms, networks, infrastructure for the next generation of our society. And these platforms are increasingly ruled by algorithms, algorithmic systems, uh, you know, all the way up to AI. Uh, you know, but th there's systems that are simply, you know, somebody's write, written a bunch of rules uh, all the way up to, through big data to systems that seem to program themselves. And I say seem. Uh, and the question is, w how do we think about a society that's ruled by algorithms? You know, and we're starting to see the impact, you know, as Facebook, for example, uh, has started feeding us fake news. And it's, it's actually kind of interesting because the, the fundamental algorithm of Facebook is not, you know, give people fake news. It's give people what they want. And if you basically, uh, you know, like your friends' photos uh, of, um, uh, you know, their, their recent vacation or their kids' Halloween, that's what Facebook will show you. I mean, Joaquin, uh, you're in the audience. And, yeah. But if you say, wow, I want to see, uh, you know, stories ragging on Donald Trump or ragging on Hillary Clinton, that's what you'll see. And so the algorithm, in some sense, is a mirror of our own desires. But it also has choices that it makes for us by saying that the things that we want, that we like to see, that we share, give us more of that. And so the thing that I've been using as an analogy is that the algorithms that we build are a little bit like the, um, the genies of Arabian mythology. Uh, uh, you know, you, you know the story if you ever watched Aladdin, or maybe even if you, how many people here have ever seen Fantasia, the movie? Uh, yeah, you remember how Mickey Mouse, this is not actually a genie, but it's a similar thing. He has a spell, right? And the spell, he tries to say, uh, get these brooms to help me do my chore of carrying water. And they run away. You know, they, they start bringing more and more water until he's flooded out. And that's actually an example of what uh, you know, they call the runaway objective function. You know, so this algorithmic system 
uh, it has a goal, and it goes crazy. And this has been what uh, you know, people who are afraid of the far future of AI have talked about. Nick Bostrom in his book Superintelligence uses the sort of crazy thought experiment of a, an AI a robot that's designed to make paper clips and it, it wants to make, do nothing but make paper clips, but it becomes self-improving so it goes haywire and wants to, you know, get rid of humans because they're in the way of making paper clips. We gave it the wrong wish, so to speak, in the, in the language of genies. Uh, Elon Musk, in one of his interviews, used the example of a strawberry picking robot that's, uh, you know, self-improving. And uh, it, it basically decides that humans are in the way of strawberry fields forever. Uh, so that's the idea of the runaway objective function. But the point that I make in the book is that this is not a far future phenomenon. You know, fake news is a runaway objective function. But more importantly, and this is what I was really building towards, uh, was the idea that we're getting the economy that we ask for. We didn't mean to create an opioid crisis when we said, starting in the 70s, the only uh, purpose of a business is to create wealth for its shareholders. That we, and we started to en en enshrine that in corporate law. But that's what we got. You know, and so the question is, just as we're now in this, uh, you know, uh, time when we're we're trying to hold Facebook and Twitter and Google accountable uh, for the content on their platforms, the unintended consequences of their algorithms, uh, the basically the wishes gone wrong. You know, we asked the genie. Uh, to give us relevance in Google's case, to give us this kind of engagement in Facebook's case, whatever. And the genies are giving us exactly what we asked for, and we're going, whoa, it wasn't quite what we meant. But we're not actually holding uh, the people who've created the algorithms that run our economy to account in the same way. And I think that's what's starting to happen. Uh, you know, anyway, yeah. So, so, so I think let's, let's so, you, so we're, we're talking about the platform economy, how that's kind of gets, gets, gets kind of, essentially takes off many benefits to the, to the to platform economy, some kind of now downsides thing, oh my gosh, they're also getting increasingly powerful and they're going, as they go global, they got a lot more running room ahead of them. So before we get into the kind of guts of how to retool the whole economy, let's just get into, the, just focus for a little bit here on a kind of the nature of the platform economy and why in the last year has it, besides the, the, the kind of fake news thing, there's essentially a shifting of Platforms are getting extremely central to the way the economy works, where the future work's going to go, and also they are getting increasingly powerful. And so there's good sides and bad sides about that, but how do you think about this rise of the platform economy? Well, I actually, first of all, would broaden beyond tech. I think that's we, one. We do want to get there. No, sure. I understand, well, but, but no, seriously, though. Right I, I, okay. I, 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 okay. You can't just say, well, well, let's just talk about tech. The platform economy is container shipping. It's, uh, you know, how our power works, uh, our, how uh, our transportation works, uh, how our financial system works. So tech is helping us to see it. And I think it's really important. You know, just like I mentioned earlier about free software, the narrative left out the internet. If you have a narrative about tech that's only about Facebook and only about Uber and only about Google, you're missing the point. What I've tried throughout the book, you know, like for example, I go, okay, we have people managed by algorithm with contingent workers, and everybody says, Uber, Lyft, oh, contingent workers, bad. And I go, wait a minute, McDonald's, The Gap, Walmart, contingent workers, just a different algorithm. You know, so we have to actually see that this is a pervasive okay. societal thing. It's not about Google and Facebook and Twitter. And the fact that we're making it about them means that we're missing the opportunity to see what's really going on and to change the future. This is an incredible teachable moment to see, first of all, that markets are outcomes. of a, They're a designed system. They're not a natural phenomenon. And just as we expect our internet giants to improve their algorithms when we see that they're not producing the correct results, I think we have to actually say, wait a minute, we've been sold a bill of goods that somehow the market economy is just a natural phenomenon, it's not subject, don't interfere with it, that's a bad idea, because the only alternative is either socialism or unadulterated capitalism. 
And I'm going, no, no, no. This is a built system that's shaped by rules. Let's rewrite the rules. Okay, let's go there. I think that's totally, uh, that's a good course correction here. So, but so, so lay out to folks who haven't read your book your, your kind of a idea of we've hit our sky in that moment. In other words, that yeah. there was a shift, and, and to walk it through from the 70s. So there was an economy at work post-war yeah. that started to shift in the late 70s around kind of Reagan and kind of yeah. free market fundamentalism. Explain that shift and explain what went wrong and why we've hit yeah. our Skynet moment, which is kind of interesting way to think yeah, about Yeah, so um, I've already mentioned this idea of the runaway objective function, and, and I really try to make the point that the biggest example of this I in our economy is our financial system. And there literally was a point where we changed the rules. Uh, you know, and, and it's very interesting if you, if you look back at that post-war period, it was very much shaped by what went before, the, the interwar period between the First World War and the Second World War. Because after the First World War, we made really bad choices as a society. You know, there was this terrible world war, and the victors punished the losers. Uh, they abandoned their returning, uh, you know, veterans. Uh, you know, there was, uh, if you may know, there was a famous, uh, you know, veterans camped out on the Washington Mall, actually fired on by Douglas MacArthur, uh, who was, uh, you know, uh, basically putting down the so-called uh, kind of the rebellion. They burned the tents of the of the campers, drove them out. This was a pretty bad situation. We went into the Great Depression. We saw the rise of fascism uh, in, in Europe, uh, and you know, back to do over Second World War. What did we do after the Second World War? We made really good, far-sighted choices. You know, we invested in our former enemies. We basically rebuilt Japan, rebuilt, uh, you know, Europe, uh, sent all the returning veterans to school, gave them loans to invest in businesses. You know, we basically said, whoa, we screwed up last time. And the problem was that just like every other intervention in the market, eventually it doesn't work, right? So we started to get, you know, we basically had this idea that full employment was good, that rising wages were good, and then we got in this inflationary spiral, and by the 70s they were like, whoa, inflation bad, you know, and instead of going, okay, let, let's, we gotta tweak the algorithm, we gotta basically rewrite the rules, we gotta, you know, and again, this is, what I try to do in the book is tell the story, for example, of Google search quality and fake news as examples of here are people who are managing an algorithmic system, you know, teaching it new tricks in response to new threats. A and, you know, but what we tend to have tended to do in our public policy is simply go, well, that's a bad idea, throw it all out, and we'll try a new one, rather than going, okay, well, this one also has run its course. You know, so we basically, you know, how long has it been since there's been meaningful inflation? That's still the, bu the bugaboo. You know, they're still focused on preserving capital, preserving, you know, the, the rights of capital. Uh, and instead, you know, the problem really has been the hollowing out of the economy. Uh, and, and this really started really with this new idea that really was, uh, came out in the early 70s. The, the first real shot was uh, an essay by Milton Friedman in the New York Times. And I recently learned a little context on this, which I'm going to but it was basically was uh, the, the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits was the title of the article. And it, it basically made the case that, and, and it was a reasonable economic case that there was a problem which economists later refer to as the agency problem, which is that the people who were running businesses don't actually own them and they have incentives uh, to look after themselves rather than the true owners of the business. And also the idea that, hey, they should just give the money back to the shareholders who will then decide what, um, they, what, what you know, good ends they will invest in. Turns out uh, somebody went back and found the, the New York Times article, and the context of this was actually Ralph Nader's campaign uh, to, to call for safer cars and for better fuel efficiency. So <laughs> it actually was a, uh, you know, if you look at it, it, it historically, you go, wow, uh, those are the very things that we should have been focused on. The market was failing to do the right thing, and this was a bad step. But this idea really took hold. It was uh, promulgated by a guy named Michael Jensen at Harvard Business School, 
Uh, and it really became the basis of a whole new approach to corporate governance, where you literally, any company out there says, oh yeah, we, I have a fiduciary duty to make money for our shareholders. If we consider anything else, we're potentially liable. And this is actually taught. You know, like, if you basically look, and that's why we have things like B Corps. And I go, I hate B Corps. You mean, you're telling me, the reason I hate, I, I mean, I love the idea, but I was like, every company should be a B Corp. What are you telling me, that, that, that a normal company can be a psychopath? You know, that, <laughs> that, that, that its basic goal should be to eliminate human labor whenever possible? You know, its basic goal should be to screw customers if that's what increases profits? I mean, you know, so I kind of, I wrote this one essay, I was like, okay, you know, uh, Dow 22500, that's, uh, you know, Michael Jensen. Uh, you know, uh, uh, passenger dragged off an airplane, that's Michael Jensen too. Opioid crisis, that's Michael Jensen. You know, it's like it all comes as a package. And I kind of feel like this is a great example of this runaway objective function problem, and we're failing in that fundamental goal of, uh, 21st century management, which is the management of our algorithms. Because we are in a world that's ruled by algorithms. And we have some great lessons from tech companies about the kind of iterative, data-driven, user-centered processes that are used to manage algorithms, but we're not applying them in the realm of our society and our governance and all of the things that, you know, are shaping our society in the, in the broadest sense. And as a result, you know, we're seeing this hollowing out of our economy. We're seeing incredible pain and dislocation in our society. And we're telling ourselves that it's out of our control. And the basic message of my book is it's not out of our control. It's a choice, and we need to make better choices. Love it. Um, So this kind of just let's just bring in the the food camp thing a minute here. So, yeah. food camp um, this year, if I may paraphrase what I think happened there, and there's folks here could also add to it, um, was an interesting mix of technologists, policy people, economists, mm -hmm. um, East Coast West Coast, and it was really trying to come to terms with well, what do you do in the context mm -hmm. of that mega yeah. meta. Yeah. algorithm out of control for the whole economy. How do you shift the whole economy around that? And two, what do you do with the platform economy, which is kind of a subset of it, yeah. as you yeah. rightly put sure. it, but still is problematic, given that there's a winner-take-all part, and it's, yeah. it's, it's got its own disruptive functions. So can you talk a little bit about what some of the s ways people have been thinking about? How do we move this ball well, forward? Well, one of the things that Peter's referring to, there was, uh, was a kind of interesting debate session uh, uh, that um, involved a bunch of people advocating for breaking up uh, Google, for example, and uh, you know, really taking a pretty hard antitrust stance towards the platforms. Uh, I actually think that's probably the wrong approach. Uh, that's not to say that there isn't some idea of antitrust that's appropriate, but I've been thinking a lot about a very, very different approach to antitrust, which is that we get incredible benefit from platforms. They're what gives our economy scale and, and uh, this incredible you know, wealth-creating power of uh, decreasing costs as you get to that scale. But here's the fundamental idea uh, uh, of where we went wrong. We thought that the benefits of that scale belong to the platform. And I think you know, part of what we have to figure out is what's the right balance between the platform and what it supports? Because you know, think about the word platform. It's something that you build on. You know, think about the ecosystem. You know, I, I actually really think a lot of that we need to kind of rethink our economy as an ecosystem, that we have to actually understand. So, so, for, so for me, the, the, there's an interesting set of issues and questions that have been raised in my mind and that I've g got some uh, really good insights on. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. About, first of all, how do we visualize and understand uh, the distributional economics of platforms? There's a wonderful uh, book title that I, I love and it's become kind of my mantra for what, what we need to think about. It's, it's, a, it's a book uh, by an economist named Alvin E. Roth 
and it was actually given to me by um, Jonathan Hall, who's the chief economist at, U at Uber, and he said, this is my Bible. And what it turns out to be about, uh, Roth got his Nobel Prize for redesigning the marketplace for kidney transplants, and, uh, which is a wonderful point because it gets across the idea that marketplaces are outcomes. They're designed things. They're not just natural because he redesigned the, the marketplace for, for kidney uh, transplants and saved many, many lives as a result by simply doing the math for how you would apportion uh, you know, uh, kidneys. Uh, he, he managed to get many more uh, uh, donors and, uh, and uh, recipients matched up. Uh, the book's title is Who Gets What and Why? And that's the fundamental question of our economy. It's the fundamental question of of platforms as well. And I think there's an incredible opportunity with our technology platforms, uh, because they are economies in their own right, to use them as a laboratory, in some sense, for understanding who gets what and why, and start to build, actually, an economics in which we measure that. Uh, you know, so I started thinking, actually, my son-in-law, Saul Griffith, uh, is sitting over there, and he built uh, a, a, a something called the Sankey diagram for the entire U.S. energy economy. Actually, he debuted it here at what's now yeah, yeah. San Francisco yeah. on this screen. Yeah. And it is since, this is just a worth just a little digression, that video of that thing and his kind of prototype of that is now funded by the Department of Energy and you got a big program that you're expanding it and it's going nuts. So yeah. this is yeah. a great little success story of unveiling it here. But anyhow, yeah. sorry. So, so it seems to me <laughs> that that similar approach uh, you know, could be used to visualize a whole bunch of things about platforms. Because right now we have a, you know, a model for looking at companies and it's a financial statement. And uh, first of all, there's a couple of things I want you to notice about if, if, you, uh, if you ever, if you know financial statements and a, what a profit and loss looks like, uh, this is a really important consideration. People, employees are a cost. You know, what we are trying to optimize for is the leftover return to capital. That's called the bottom line, right? So right there you can see what is the objective function of a business is actually instantiated even in our financial statements. We don't have a financial statement that says, like a Sankey diagram does, here are all the inputs and here are all the outputs. And I think we need to start building, you know, so for example, we think about, okay, we're all contributing to Google. We're all contributing to Facebook. We also get a huge amount of value from Google and Facebook. How do we measure that? We don't really even have a language for measuring that. But there are some things that we can start to think about as proxies. So for example, while we all contribute to Google, for example, by clicking on links, by uh, uh, you know, creating uh, web links that point to sites that in informs their, their search engine, probably the best proxy right now is, well, there's a bunch of websites out there and they're what Google points to. And so let's actually understand to what extent does Google still point to those websites instead of pointing to itself? Well, I just did some back of the napkin math uh, the other day, and over the last five years, the amount of Google ad revenue that is on Google sites has gone from about 70% to about 80% to 82%, and the, the, the amount that was on other people's sites has gone from 30% down to 18%. So in other words, Google is actually taking more and more of the web ecosystem for itself. And just think about it. You know, and their, their story is completely consistent with a model that says, hey, there's, only, there's two things that matter. First of all, that we, become, that we continue to grow. And that's, there's, there's a whole thread in the book about why is it that companies that say we have uh, super voting stock, so we're immune from the long, uh, you know, from, from short-termism, why they're still compelled to, to feel like we must keep growing. That's a separate question. But look at this, uh, you know, this question of what happens in the end when there's no more ad revenue, you know, to the news publishers, when there's no more ad revenue to various kinds of sites and services, because Google has told itself you know, it's really okay as long as we're serving the user. And I, I'm a little conflicted about it because from a, 
purely user point of view, I go, yeah, I used to look at this site, flightaware.com, when I wanted to know when my flight was, if, you know, uh, you know, Jen was coming in and I wanted to know when her flight, whether the flight was going to be on time. And now Google just shows me directly, you know, I just have to type in the search number. But they just basically took away the business of a s site that used to do that. And I go, well, they did it and it's better for me. But where does that logic lead us? And, you know, so the very first thing we have to at least act is, is we can measure that. And we can say, oh, okay, if you had a Sankey diagram, you'd basically be saying, okay, well, here's all the outputs that Google creates. Uh, and I actually proposed to Hal Varian, Google's chief economist, that they actually use this. They do these economic impact reports on the impact of Google advertising, but they're kind of context-free. And the thing that's kind of nice about a Sankey diagram is all the inputs and all the outputs. And, you know, we can't get there for the whole economy, but I think we could get a lot closer. And so the, the anyway, back, back to this sort of question mm -hmm. of should they be broken up, I think we should first understand them and understand who's getting what and why and is it is it is the distribution does the distribution seem fair and is it getting better or worse totally got you now there's so many ways we can go deep here uh but i want to take up a couple last things before we go into conversation yeah, yeah. with everyone here so it seemed to me that a lot of the kind of break them up uh were kind of doj investigations that kind of stuff was kind of 20th century yeah. solutions apply which was interesting coming from a lot of east coast folks in the rooms as opposed to figuring out a 21st century ways to re-regulate the economy in yeah. new ways. And the piece that I, it struck me, because I've been around here for more than 20 years myself, and you've been around longer, is it feels to me like there's a ton of goodwill in the tech community to do the right thing. Yeah. There's not that's this right. kind of winner-take-all, rapacious, just, you know, that's the way the, ro the, the yeah. world goes. So, I, and you know the scene so well, it's like, what can be, what is your, feeling of the, 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 the gut feeling now, or, the, or the, the, the kind of zeitgeist of the tech community, the innovation economy of the Bay Area yeah. particularly, towards really making some big gestures, some new moves, and some real leadership in actually reworking this kind of spot yeah. we've got ourselves into. You know, I, I guess I would say two things. One, um, the, we're still the taxi cab with the screen in the back. You know, we, we, uh, we as a society, we as an industry, there's a lot of things that we accept as, well, this is just the way it is, that are not inevitable. I mean, we are, uh, you know, we, we, we still assume, for example, that uh, it's only normal and natural that when companies give out stock options, they give them out incredibly highly weighted to the top. You know, we, we go, we, we haven't questioned, well, what should the fair distribution of the success of a company be? You know, we kind of assume that it all goes one way. Uh, we, we haven't actually even asked ourselves whether, um, you know, again, if I, if I go out into some, you know, science fiction future, it is entirely possible to imagine a future in which our whole market economy is radically changed. Uh, you know, and people like Cory Doctorow have done this, you know, uh, in his first book, Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom, he uh, posited a world in which the machines could make anything. And we, we you know, we're getting there. You know, the, 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 there weren't resource constraints, that physical stuff was basically free, you could have whatever you want, and the economy was based on attention and the ability to kind of create things that people cared about. And you go, actually, that's a lot gives you a pretty deep insight into what's true about a lot of our present economy. You know, we have commodities. You think about a uh, great example that came up in Alexis Madrigal's Containers podcast, uh, which is well worth listening to, uh, was coffee. Think about it. Coffee was a commodity. And now people will pay $45 in some places for this special combination of this coffee came from this unique place, you know, where they grew it on the, you know, this perfect hillside, and it was roasted by this guy in Emeryville, <laughs> uh, you know, who's the best roaster ever. And suddenly, this commodity is super valuable again. <laughs> you know, that's basically the attention economy, you know, in the physical world. And of course, we see this on you know, Facebook and, and, and uh, Twitter and uh, YouTube, you know, the whole social media, people are creating for each other, entertaining each other, and there's a whole set of things that are this sort of creative value add to a world that's basically commodities. 
And so you could imagine that going point where everything we pay for today is a commodity and it really is a creative economy. And the thing that's sort of interesting, Corey did a sequel to that book, it's called Walk Away. And it's how we got, we get to that uh, you know, future economy without money. It's just people walking away uh, from the current economy. And it's funny because once you get a concept like that, you know, back to your first question about seeing the world differently, it's just like some concept lands in your head and then you start seeing it. So walk away. Uh, my wife and I were in Tulsa at the Code for Tulsa. Uh, she runs an organization called Code for America. She uh, works to improve the operation of, uh, of government programs so that they can be as good as uh, the best consumer services. And uh, there's a woman there, it's a sort of community groups around the, around the country who, who, who kind of work uh, on, on these issues. And there's a woman there and she's wearing what looks like a kind of a train conductor's outfit. And <laughs> we go, well, what are you doing? And she says, well, I used to be a real estate agent. And then I started volunteering at a food bank. And, you know, it was so much more, uh, you know, valuable to me. And so that's what I do all the time now. I, I actually have a horse-drawn mobile grocery store that I take around the food deserts. And, uh, you know, uh, on Tuesday, we're at the women's shelter. And on Wednesday, we're at the old folks' home. And we basically have an organic farm where we're growing our own food. And we buy stuff from the big box stores when it's on sale and sell, resell it at cost. You know, this is like a Burning Man project, except it's in Tulsa, <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know? And she's a walk away. She basically said, I don't really like the way the economy works. I have a better idea. I can make meaningful work making people happy, you know, and, and making the world a better place. And I, I kind of, I, I love that idea that we can just choose to do it differently. We can build an economy where people matter, that it's not just about you know, we're on the treadmill of uh, increasing more, more, more. Because the fact is, the good life is not more, more, more. The good life is often less. You've got folks that believe it. Um, okay. Just a few last thoughts before we yeah. open it up. A better way forward. You, you've, um, in your book, you do talk about things, again, that I don't want to just always draw it back to tech, but the tech innovation community yeah. is one. You've sure. been rooted in one, we're rooted in here. What are the high bars you'd start saying in the coming years here? You'd want, or even just starting now, to start really swinging for the fences. Uh, you talked about fundamentally rethinking stock options. Or yeah. what you call super money, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you talk about figuring out ways that AI augments humans rather than yeah. replaces them. I mean, uh, there's some high bar yeah. general concepts, but even some tactical things. Just give, because there's a lot of folks here who are tied into awesome companies and awesome yeah. outfits. Like, what do we start doing now yeah. to start it going? Because, you know, we don't have a yeah. lot of time here. The sure. Uh, well, well, the first thing I would say I I is the fundamental design pattern of technology has always been uh, to enable people to do things that were previously impossible. And you know, think about in the Industrial Revolution, we augmented our muscles, but go back to the Stone Age. You know, we had weapons that would let us take down animals that would uh, you know, eat us in, in a heartbeat, but we suddenly gave ourselves bigger, sharper claws than they had. You know, that was augmentation. So augmentation of human beings is the secret gift of technology. And uh, so the, the first thing I have to ask is, why are we telling companies that the thing they should do with technology is get rid of people? You know, I, I talked to one investor who said, oh, I just invested in a startup that will get rid of 30% of call center jobs. And I said, wait a minute, have you interacted with a call center? Was it a good experience? <laughs> you know, why are you simply saying you're gonna do the same thing more cheaply? You know, why wouldn't you want to do it better? And, and in fact, you see that, you know, in Amazon. You know, this narrative that technology wants to get rid of jobs, totally wrong. I mean, here's Amazon, they added 45,000 robots and they added 250,000 people because they didn't say, we're gonna do the same thing more cheaply. They said, we're gonna start getting products out for same day delivery. We're gonna get a lot more products out for next day delivery. You know, we're gonna expand our ability to get, you know, stuff to people faster. Now, whether that's a truly worthy goal, 
may or may not, you know, be the point. But I will also say, you know, there's other people who are using on-demand technology, again, to augment our capabilities. Uh, one of my favorite startups is one called Zipline, uh, which is delivering blood, uh, you know, and, and critical me me medicines in Rwanda, you know, where, where you know, postpartum hemorrhage is the leading cause of death in women, and they're like, wow, with drones and on demand, we can get blood anywhere in the country, uh, you know, to a clinic in, in uh, you know, 15 minutes. You know, so we don't have to have our old infrastructure of healthcare where you'd have to have a big central hospital that has all the facilities to store the blood. We can have three of them and we can cover the whole country with drones. And you go, that's actually going, wow, we have new superpowers. We can do it differently. We don't have to put the screen in the back of the taxi cab. We can actually rethink the economy. And the thing that I really want, you know, those of, uh, uh, of us who are in technology to take seriously is, we can reinvent the world with these technologies. Why are we just doing little tweaks around the edges? We have this enormous opportunity to tackle hard problems that were previously unsolvable. And I guess the one other thing that is just super important is some of those problems are going to really come and bite us hard. And if we want to, uh, you know, climate change being a, a good example, we got to get ahead of some of these things. And so again, when I hear the robots are going to take all the jobs, I go, well, shit, you know, there's so much to do. We're going to need the damn robots to help us. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, just last question here, just in more of a, you know, we're living in, we're just finishing the first year since the Trump election. Um, we've watched uh, a big, these inequality mounting, a lot of backlash to tech. Are you, how hopeful or how optimistic are you that we're at a place here where we can move through this and get through this? And, and, and wh what kind of words of encouragement you might get about where we are in this, in this, this kind of historical moment? Because it yeah. feels like there's either, we're either gonna go down here or we're gonna gum up in a different way. Yeah. I'm curious your own thinking about that because you've been good at, well, uh, you're, you're, you're a classicist, long yeah. history, long view guy. What, what, what do you, what, how would well, you talk about where we're at in the country and where we can go and how optimistic you are? Well, I, I do think that the, 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 the thing that makes me hopeful as a result of what happened with Trump is we've broken the old patterns. You know, it's pretty clear that we don't know what the future is now. You know, there wasn't a, uh, somebody, somebody said that there was a, there's always an official future. Well, the official future got broken, you know, which was more of the same. And so that really puts it back on us, you know, back to the title of the book, which I have to, I have to be, uh, give credit. The, the, uh, the title of the book was not written by me. It was written by my wife uh, who said, uh, you know, you know I, I had the book was WTF, What's the Future? She said, what's the future and why it's up to us? Because that is the key message, you know, that we have choices to make. And, and we're basically being told by these changes in our society that it's time for us to step up. Because the old way of thinking about things isn't working. And we have to make it new. And we're going to go through a lot of trouble and a lot of pain, but we have just begun the process of rethinking uh, the world and rebuilding the world. And it's really up to us to make good choices so that the world we build is better than the one that we have today. Here, here. <laughs> All right. Well, that is a great place to segue to a conversation with all of you. And um, we've got two mics, as always. And uh, if people want to just raise their hands, we're also going to bring it, yeah, bring up the lights a little bit here. Uh, plenty of thoughts here. We want to move it around. And uh, okay, we got here. What? We got a hand here. And just keep your hands up so I can kind of understand where folks are over time. And uh, but let's start over here with it. You got one there? Uh, hey, Tim. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm really could you stand up? There. Here's the part of the thing. Stand up. Say who you are. You just want to give a little who you are, and then boom, ask your question. Uh, Dave Witzel, I'm with RASA, the Regenerative Agriculture Sector Accelerator. Uh, awesome. And thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, I, I, I read a piece by Ethan Zuckerman. He went to the um, Obama summit last week, I guess. And mm -hmm. in, in the piece, he talked a little bit about how he felt like they didn't talk about politics. He was really pleased. And it was civic engagement. 
Yeah. And and I, it seems to me that the the rewriting algorithms is a policy problem. You know, we're gonna we're gonna change the rules of the game. Yeah. It also feels to me like we're bringing policy to a politics fight, and we're outgunned. Mm -hmm. The policy and the politics are getting farther and farther apart. Yeah. And they don't they don't map the way they used to. Yeah. Any insights from Gov 2.0 or Foo or the book? Well, I, I mean, I guess the one thing I will say is that um, so. I, I think that policy and politics are very, very different, actually. Uh, uh, certainly, the, the policy you know, often starts with politics, and unfortunately, it shouldn't. But a, a huge part of uh, what actually shapes the outcomes are how policies are implemented. Uh, you know, we actually never even try most of the policies that we think we try. You know, again, this is another great lesson from tech. And actually, I have a couple of chapters in the in the book about uh, you know the uh, work on on government. You know, we actually you know say we're going to do something, but then we never actually implement it. That was you know came very clear, for example, with healthcare.gov. You know, it was just like they basically built this you know botched abomination. You know, because they never really thought about it in the way that we think about things in tech, where you go, we got to build this up from you know. Uh, a piece at a time, figure out what works, do more of that, figure out what doesn't work, do less of that, iteratively, uh, user-centered. So I, th I think that there's a lot around implementation uh, you know, that we can make progress on, even in our divisive time of politics. And there are people who are still working on that. You know, I was talking at, at Foo Camp with Rob Cook, who now runs the Technology Transformation Service. Still, he started you know, in the waning days of the Obama administration and uh, is still working there under Trump. And I was asking him, what did he feel really good about? And he told me some really remarkable successes where they've been bringing tech expertise. He, he's a former uh, engineering guy from Pixar, bringing engineering uh, uh, you know, approaches and building, you know, better services at the VA for identity management across government, uh, you know, services. We're going to actually see some better government actually coming out despite, you know, because basically there's a set of people who are still working on, you know, making the infrastructure work. And I, I, I think that, you know, uh, Jen once uh, in one of her early talks said, you know, Politics is this, you know, the government is this deep ocean and politics is a six inch layer on top of it. <laughs> and, and, and we have to remember that, you know. Uh, and it's funny because uh, wherever I travel, I always take pictures of garbage trucks and Jen always takes pictures of manholes because we're both kind of obsessed with the fact that this is actually civilization at work. <laughs> <laughs> In the back there, we got a woman back there. Uh, I'm Janet Mon from the Passport Foundation. I, I'm listening to everything you've just said and following up on that question. On the front page of the New York Times today, the Paradise Papers are showing that um, Apple has been stashing hundreds of billions of dollars in offshore havens. Yeah. Uh, Google is one of the biggest lobbyists in Washington right now. Yeah. I'm wondering how that fits with um, the analysis in your book and oh, how you uh, think uh, about very technology. Very, very much. I, I basically make the case in the book that, again, this idea of shareholder value is the master algorithm of our society. And that, you know, these sort of, you know, I, I kind of make the case that these are effectively proto AIs, Google, Facebook, and the like, you know, the system as itself. And we are part of them. You know, there's, there's really this idea we have that AI is this other thing. You know, we create this robot, this. Uh, you know, this computer program that somehow magically becomes intelligent. And I actually think that we are building AIs and we are its microbiome. You know, the future AI is, is this vast system that connects, you know, millions, billions of humans into a dynamic market, uh, electronically mediated, and it's, a, it's sort of a superorganism. And that superorganism is basically ruled by these objective functions, as I described. And the master objective function is make money. You know, so basically, you know, why is it that you know Apple, uh, you know, says, "Wow, we don't want to actually, uh, you know, repatriate those profits and pay our taxes." You know, why is it that you know Google is lobbying? 
because that's the basic goal that's encoded into the DNA of every company. But, but is there anything that you think to break that, w waiting for the government to shift that rule? Yeah. Is there anything that the tech companies could do to just say, you know, we get it, we need to do stuff differently? Is there uh, any kind of way that you could see you some know, leadership there? Uh, you know, I think the thing that I'm kind of most interested in, actually this is one of the interesting things I got from, from Foo Camp, uh, you know, is uh, just some, there's some history that's very relevant. Uh, at a number of points in economic history, that's during the, the, the you know the, the uh, late Middle Ages and, and, and early Renaissance, uh, and, and actually l even later the, in the trading periods, power shifted from country to country because uh, the, the, the people who had too much power were no, could no longer be trusted. Uh, you know, so kings, you know would renege on their debts because they were too powerful. And, and there was a particular period in British history, I, I forget which king it was, where basically they tied the king's hands because that was the only way to restore trust in the monarchy. You know, I mean, not tied him physically, but just where basically, you know, by actually imposing limits. And I think we actually do have to impose some serious limits on platforms all these platforms through our society around what their obligation is to the rest of society. And I, I do think that it will, in, in some sense, take a revolution. I think, and, and I quote Andy McAfee uh, in my book where he says, the, the people will rise up before the robots do. And we, and we really have to have that rising up of the people. We have to have uh, sort of a set, you know, a lot of people have asked me in the book, what do you want us to do? And, and, and I say, I want you to believe that it could be different. You know, there was a period when most people believed in the divine right of kings. And then some people came along and said, no, we don't, we're not gonna believe that anymore. And they actually put their lives on the line to make a different kind of, of nation. You know, I, I always loved the, the, you know, the l statement of ben Benjamin Franklin, you know, where he said, we must all hang together, gentlemen, or we will assuredly all hang separately, <laughs> you know? And y y we forget that, you know, the people who started this country put their lives on the line. If they had not won the Revolutionary War, they would have been executed, you know? Uh, the, the, um, and, and yet what happened was they said, no, we believe something different. And, you know, I, I've always loved the story that I heard uh, uh, about what George III said when he learned that George Washington had not declared himself king of America. He, that's what he thought was gonna happen. That you know, once you know, the, the Americans had won, that George Washington would take over the kingship. And it was like, and, and he, he apparently said, you know, when, he, when George Washington went back to his farm, he said, if he has done that, he is the greatest man the world has ever seen. We came to believe something could be different. Uh, and, and you know, it's not easy. You know, it was not easy in America. We're still fighting to perfect that union. You know, we don't, you know, we, uh, that, that phrase, a more perfect union. You know, it's not perfect by any, any and in some ways it's getting worse at the moment. But, uh, you know, people around the world came to believe something different. And I think that we can't, and, and of course, that's the thing that's sort of a beautiful, you know, lesson from tech, because people come to believe something different and they remake the world. And the thing that I think that we, we, we need to actually all do is get that technology has made it possible for us to build a very different world than the one we grew up in. And we have to start imagining what it could be and what we want it to be. Fantastic. We got David Bank in the back there, yeah? Go ahead. Hey, hey Tim, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna sort of pile on my, my neighbor here. Um, I love this, this book, I'm gonna find who gets, who gets what and why, and it strikes me that this conversation, I was also struck at Food Camp by the, the sort of range of responses to, 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 to Google, et cetera, was you know, sort yeah. of ranged from you know, break them up to sort of run them out of town on a rail and tar and feather them, and that was the entire kind of spectrum. There were a particular set of people yeah, who there, were on that. Uh, I understand, yeah. I understand, but it, was, it did strike me as a little bit of a sea change and, and somewhat yeah. reminiscent of the way the tech world saw, or parts of the tech world saw, Microsoft back in the day, yeah. and, that, and then there was a, a an insurrection, of, of, so to speak, which partly was aided by antitrust action yeah, as well, yeah. but there's sort of an insurrection brewing. So that was sort of one fact, and then the second fact that 
comes up is that there's another debate that's purely about literally an algorithm called the tax code that's being debated yeah. now, right? And, um, and, and, as, and as she said, there's, there's hundreds of billions of dollars and, the, and, and being parked overseas and just, you know, insisting that they need to get a tax holiday to bring those taxes back, yeah. back home. I wonder whether there's, you know, that's literally the, the locus for some kind of debate about what this, who gets what yeah, and why, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and what you might, you know, what, how, how, let me just put it to you, how you might actually articulate that, yeah. what that's called so there's a move, that movement can develop. Yeah, well, I think that's o only one of, of, of many things that we need to question. And, and uh, you know, I think there has been a pretty interesting, uh, you know, rise of people who are questioning, uh, you, know, we, we, you know, we call it populism, uh, you know, but there has not been a corresponding rise of fresh ideas about how to do a, a fairer system. A lot of the populist you know, rhetoric is sort of backward looking rather than forward looking. And I think we need a new populism uh, that's focused on understanding that, you know, that there's plenty to go around and it's just not going around in the right way. And we need to actually rethink what would we do if we were trying to basically make uh, a better, fairer world? What would our policies be? And, and I think that we, you know, we underestimate. Uh, again, uh, how many people here have seen Hamilton? Okay, not enough of you. It's a wonderful account of, you know, the writing of the Federalist Papers. You know, just like which was this, you know, uh, this, you know uh, this wonderful scene in which Hamilton basically is trying to recruit, uh, actually Aaron Burr, who did not participate, uh, to help write this, basically, this case to be made for this new form of government. You know, it was like a selling job, and it was a hard selling job. You know, and, and, and we're just not, we're just barely beginning that process. And there are people who are thinking, wow, we could do this differently. We could build a different kind of, of, uh, of economy. What would that look like? And where will we find the politi politicians who will sort of stand up instead of using uh, basically, you know, populism to reinforce uh, plutocracy, which is what's happening, you know, in the Trump administration, where would we find, you know, a, a system where we're saying, wow, how will we use this incredible power we have as a society to create wealth? Because capitalism, as we've built it, has been an enormous you know, engine of progress. You know, you look at, um, you know, life expectancy, for example. It's, you know, there's this great chart from, uh, our world in data, which is a fabulous site out of Oxford, and you kind of see, you know, you know, it's kind of flat, flat for 500 years. You know, the only thing that happens is during plagues and wars, it goes down sometimes. You know, life expectancy, but it never goes up. And then suddenly, middle of the 1800s, just up and to the right. You know, human life expectancy. And then what's really interesting, he's got this interactive thing where you can add additional countries, and you look at countries, and whenever they join the Industrial Revolution life expectancy up and to the right. And that's a pretty powerful testament to the incredible power of technology to do good. So I go, okay, so we got life expectancy. We're, we're making good progress on that front. Let's, let's tackle some of the other great problems of the world, right? Because we can make wealth for everyone. We can make a better society, and we're just not necessarily doing it as well as we could. Well, and also, I mean, I think there's a differentiation, too. I mean, you, you keep going back to the industrial age technologies, but the digital infrastructure is, is a literally a world historical shift, right? I mean, we're kind of reworking everything yeah. through digital networks and well, platforms. I mean, so there feels like there's something different than just another technology. Well, this is yeah, some no, kind of I, I, not, I, don't buy, I don't buy that. In fact, I was just uh, uh, met with Sam Lesson, uh, who's a former Facebook employee uh, at um, uh, he runs a podcast called Modest Conversations, and he was showing me a series of books he's reading about the evolution of the radio industry. And he's, he's a good friend of Mark Zuckerberg's, and he said, I, I gave Mark a copy of this book, uh, you know, because, oh my God, it's exactly what we're going through today. <laughs> you know, all of the debates, you know, uh, were about radio. And it's just like, he said, yeah, and he said to me, you know, one of the big problems with Silicon Valley is people don't read enough history. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. uh, 
<laughs> All right, we got a, we got one over here. We got a lot of more. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello, my name is Leon Haimovich, and um, I uh, work for a company called OEC Island. And OEC is not CEO for dialectic people, but Organizational Excellence Canary. And uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And has anybody told you that you look very much like Clint Eastwood? You look like Clint Eastwood. That's, oh. your, que that's your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, um, and I will have a, a continuation of this question, if I may. Uh, Oh, like this, can you hear me better like this, if it's a little bit further? Yeah. OK. So uh, thank you for being somewhat like Clint Eastwood, being this kind of champion of somebody who is an individual going against uh, whatever is uh, mainstream now, bringing us into uh, something else. But your uh, reliance on technology, will it work? Because as you said, the technology augments us humans. And this way, I believe, it takes away from us the need to develop, to fight, to be stronger, to be smarter. We have a sword, we have a gun, you know, we can now just pull, pull a trigger. We don't need all this physical dexterity, all those abilities to fight that dangerous, uh, dangerous animal anymore. Same happens with intellect, so, too, no. I believe. So, so do you think that technology will m is making us weaker? And this way, uh, we will not have, especially it works through the generation of children. When we oh. give technology to children and they don't need to develop so much, and uh, this way okay. we will create. No, okay, we got that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let, let me give you a, 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 a quick answer uh, to that, which may or may not be what you're really looking for. But my, when I was a kid, I was, you know, blind as a bat my, before I had my eye surgery. Another miracle of technology. Uh, and my, my brother used to refer to me as the failed hunter-gatherer. <laughs> uh, and uh, I've always thought about that, like when I, uh, I read Guns, Germs, and Steel, which opens with this fabulous passage called Yaley's Question, you know, which uh, it was this guy in, in Papua New Guinea saying to Jared Diamond, you guys are so stupid. How come you have all the cargo? You know? <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, that's kind of one of the things we have to come to grips with. We don't actually you know, understand what the skills that will be required in the future. I would have been an utter failure, you know, back in, in, in uh, you know, hunter-gatherer days. You know, I was blind, I was clumsy. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I once tried to kick my brother and put my foot in the toilet. You know, if I had, you know, I would have been killed by the first lion, you know, <laughs> uh, to come along, right? So, but I'm quite successful in today's world. And I, I guess I would just say, don't underestimate our children. Don't underestimate our children. They have, they're gonna have skills and we're gonna look at them and go, you know, like, wow, you know, how did you do that, you know? Uh, you know, because they, they will do things that we don't know how to do. Totally agree with that. Go ahead, we got one here. Hi. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm an engineer at Bloomberg. Thank you so much for giving this talk. And uh, my question is, you know, there was a lot of emphasis on companies like the movers and shakers, how yeah. Google is affecting this economy, how Apple is, how Amazon is. Yeah. But what about the other end where, let's say I own a startup and I'm going to a VC for my A round or my B round. How do I convince Sequoia Capital or Next World that my main goal is not shareholder profits? Well, uh, no, no, that, that's yeah, a really good point. There is, I think there's definitely something, yeah. Uh, well, uh, first off, uh, one of the things that, you know, we've been doing on that with our venture firm is we've started something called IndieVC, which is trying to bring funding to companies that don't want to play that game. That we're basically, you know, like, I have a business that's, uh, you know, I started with $500, and now a couple hundred million dollars in revenue, and we never had to make money for, you know, some investor. Uh, and there, that used to be a pretty common pattern. And, you know, 
the thing I would say about most of the Silicon Valley companies when they think about, you know, that cycle of, well, I want to get raised money, I don't even think of them as uh, entrepreneurs in a lot of cases. They're really a lot more like the actors and directors in Hollywood studios. You know, it's like basically, the, they're, they're basically highly paid temporary employees of venture capitalists, <laughs> right? Where they're basically trying to make hits. So they're really in the same business as, uh, you know, people who are making movies or whatever. It's like, okay, can I sell this idea to somebody who will fund it in the hopes that a lot of people will like it? You know, an entre you know there's a different kind of entrepreneur, which is, I want to make this thing and I want to sell it to people who want it one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm going to build that company over time. And that, you know, we need to create more of those kind of businesses. And anyway, with IndyVC, we came up with a financial instrument that's basically a, uh, a convertible note that gets paid out, that gets paid back in dividends. Uh, and, and then it, it can convert if the company decides to go raise a whole bunch of capital. But the whole point of you know, raising capital in order to create an exit for financial investors is part of the sickness, quite frankly. You know, I mean, like, uh, you know, and it's sort of interesting when you look at, at, at real entrepreneurs, they actually want to take as little capital as possible. You know, Jeff Bezos was like, how little can I get away with taking? Elon Musk was going, I'm putting my own money into this stuff because he's, he wants to build something and he wants to own it. He doesn't want to flip it and get out. Totally right. We got this woman way back here. Yeah. yeah. Hi, um, I'm Isabel Goddo. I'm a neighbor just a couple of doors down at SY Partners, um, but I also worked for Gemini Consulting way back when, part of the Cap Gemini Group. Um, as you were talking about algorithm, algorithms, I was thinking about the challenge we have ha getting more women in leadership, yeah. more diversity generally in leadership. And I was sort of thinking in two ways what is the algorithmic problem that's preventing that and also is that part of the part of the input in a way to the algorithm if we change that would it change yeah. the future more and I wondered if you've thought about that at all yeah um, you know I mean I guess that I would just sort of uh, I think somehow that algorithm change begins with you know really basic education from the earliest level you know um, uh, I wish I wish I had a, a, a better answer. I, I, I do feel like it, it's sort of funny because uh, I think it's quite clear that companies led by women uh, outperform. I mean, there's pretty good data on that, uh, and the fact that the old boys club is self-perpetuating is is um, sort of is sad. Um, uh, I, I, I yeah. I've always like tried to. Uh, in my company today is is run mostly by women. <laughs> I just confess, and I I get to be kind of out talking head out front, which is sort of great. Uh, but I I, uh, I yeah I wish I had a, an answer for how to wave a magic wand and fix that. I don't. We got in the way back there. No, wait, there's one and then you. Hey Tim, this is a uh, Joaquin from. Yeah. From, from Facebook, I work on, on yeah. applied uh, machine Can learning. Speak up a little bit. Oh, sorry, yeah, this is Joaquin from Facebook. I work on applied machine learning. Um, I, have, uh, I have two questions. Um, in, your, in your book, I get the sense that you're saying that um, AI as, as the next wave of crazy technology that's going to disrupt everything might actually amplify the imperfections of, of capitalism as we know it today. So I'd love to know if you have any concrete thoughts on how to fix it. And uh, and then the other one is I really like the way you said that that fixing the algorithms themselves to prevent bias shouldn't necessarily be the focus, but fixing maybe the policies around it or like you know what we're the, the objective function itself, which yeah. manifests itself outside algorithms, should be the yeah. focus too. And I couldn't help but think about the the social contract by Rousseau, and and I was trying to wrap my head around it and think like which way which way of the of it are we in right now, and like and like you know. Is the time you know yeah. for us to rethink to rethink everything very deeply? Yeah, I, I think I think I agree. I think rethinking the social contract is a really great way uh, to f to frame it. Uh, as to the question of whether AI will amplify, the thing I guess I've been thinking uh, about first of all is um, 
AI will, um, you know, it, it definitely will, has the potential to make things worse, but it has the potential to make so many things better. I mean, I, I, I just, I kind of feel like it's a little bit like saying, um, uh, uh, you know, any tool makes things worse. No, it doesn't. It's like what you do with the tool makes things better or worse. And, and I, I guess I feel like, you know, AI could be uh, making, leading to incredible advances in healthcare. I can even imagine if it will take an AI to start to understand some of these economic problems that we don't understand. I mean, just like as we've seen AlphaGo coming up with new strategies for playing the game that you know, are astonishing human players, I go, I'd be really interested to, to, to um, you know, have, you know, an AI on the Council of Economic Advisors of, uh, you know, uh, you know, at the White House, you know, kind of going, hey, you know, um, here's a totally different way to think about this problem. <laughs> so I, I, uh, uh, I do think that the fundamental question is, is not, I, I, the fundamental question is, what are we asking our creations to do for us? And are we asking for the right things? Can and then the second it? question I would say is, um, when we understand that we're not, they're not giving us what we want, uh, are, we, are we actually taking action and trying to change it? There's this uh, great quote that unfortunately I didn't remember until after I'd sent the book to the publisher from a good friend of mine uh, in the early days of the Macintosh who had this wonderful statement. He said, the skill of debugging is to figure out what you really told your program to do instead of what you thought you told it to do. <laughs> and, and I think the same is gonna be true in the age of AI. You know, we're just like, what are we really, ask the, what are we really asking these systems to do for us? And, and you know, uh, oh, we thought we were doing such and such, but here's what turned out. And, you know, and, and we, we actually are, we have a lot of skills on that in the tech industry of how do you examine a system and go, well, what's it really doing? And what do we need to change to, to bring it closer to that thing that we imagine we want it to do? Uh, thank you for, uh, my name is Camille Khan. I'm at Stanford University. And um, thank you for that interest in conversation. I, my question is, I don't know if you've read Scott Page's book, The Difference, no. but it's about diversity and yeah. the role of diversity going forward. H his yeah. view is that diversity strengthens institutions, yes. as that young lady said about women. Um, I notice in your book, in the index, there's no reference to diversity. I wonder if you had a view on diversity and in institutions going forward. Thank you. It's a really, uh, it's a really good point. Uh, I guess I would say, um, if, if should I have thought more about that? Absolutely, but I didn't. You know, and uh, part of that I would just say is I, you know, I, I basically thought about the things that, you know, I have wrestled with in my career, and, and that has not, unfortunately, been one of them. And so um, I, you know, you know, it, 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 you know I totally agree with you that that we will have a. Uh, uh, diversity does make us stronger. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what, what to tell you. I, okay. you know, another, another I don't here. cover it in the book. We've got a few more questions here, but go ahead. Yeah. You got the mic here. Didn't Hi, Tim. My name is Dick Brower. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on how you see the, the recent upcoming of the, of the blockchain and how that addresses some of the concerns of ownership and agency or, or does not. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I have, you know, this sort of a, a set of questions that I have about blockchain. First of them is, is uh, the sort of the the um, you know this there's clearly some efficient inefficiencies in the system, energy-wise, that may be fatal to it as a technology. Uh, the second thing, I, I I think that the that the um, it's still early in blockchain, uh, but you know, it, it, I, I haven't actually seen that it's, it, th there's some kind of spark that happens sometimes with technologies and they get over a hurdle really quickly and people are doing new things with them. And I think we're starting to get there uh, with blockchain 
but for, for a while it was a little bit like some, some of the early days of open source software where everybody was like, well, we're going to do the same thing that people did before. You know, like I, I was sort of was mad about things like the GIMP. It's like Photoshop, but it's open source. And I go, well, well, Photoshop was already there, you know, it's like just making it open source. And a lot of blockchain stuff as well, we'll do the same thing we did before, but it'll be with blockchain. And we're starting to find out what it's really good for. But again, I, I just, I'm really concerned about, you know, the instability of the systems, uh, you know, and, and the energy cost of the systems and whether they'll really scale. Um, Tim, uh, my name is Fawn. I work for one of those B corporations that you talked about earlier. Yeah, yeah. And the, I just that ought to be C corps. That every C corp ought to be like. Yeah. E exactly. And um, some of the examples you gave were more about future tense. Yeah. And so the commitment we have with our community and the work that we do is now. And mm -hmm. we made those decisions internally as a yeah. company. And I just wonder: Are the Apples? Are the Googles? Are you know, some of these companies ready to make that algorithmic change now because things are happening so quickly and they're in the perfect position to make that change. Yeah. What's your sense yeah, of that? I, I actually think it would be very, it would be nearly impossible for those companies to make that change unless they were taken private in some way. I think the, the best opportunity is, uh, you know, for new companies. I'm also not even sure that, quite frankly, that the B Corp model actually protects companies. You know, uh, look what happened to Etsy, uh, you know, where Chad Dickerson wasn't delivering the financial results, uh, got, got thrown out regardless of uh, whether it was a B Corp or not. And I actually think that there may be other structures. I, I've been really fascinated lately with uh, the co-ops that are hiding in plain sight. You know, like, you know, REI. You know, go, if you do go look at REI and compare them to their, you know, public market competitors, they have better same source sales, better s better growth. Uh, the only thing they're not better at is generating profits for shareholders because they just give it back to their customers. You know, and you go, that's actually pretty damn good evidence. Here's a two billion dollar company just sort of in the middle of the of, of all these other companies that looks like them, acts like them, creates wealth like them, but distributes it very differently. And you, you go. Well, are there more of those? And it turns out there are. There are a lot of them, and we don't talk about them. And because that dominant model has blinded us to the fact that there are alternatives, you know, the the, the uh, you know the the shareholder capitalism model is not the only model of capitalism. And, and everybody goes, well, if you're not practicing shareholder capitalism, you must be a communist. You know, kind of the old language of you know. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, and I go, no, there is actually another way to do it, and we have to invent new forms and, and not just put small glosses on the old forms. All right, a few more questions. We got a woman right here, back here, here go ahead. Yeah, uh, what about the algorithm that favors younger workers versus older workers, in other words, discriminating against older workers? Yeah. Would you uh, have the same answer as you did earlier about that uh, women are not recognized in the same way that men are in the workplace? Well, uh, I would just, I, I guess I would say that uh, in general, uh, there's a lot of bias in our society uh, and you can basically find it on so many axes, and we have to fix all of it, you know? And I, I just, you know, a, again, I, I don't, um, you know, I, I don't address that topic in the book, but I certainly agree that it's an issue. Um, you know, the, the fact is, we do have a world in which, um, Uh, to me, th probably one of the largest problems in the world is we're not taking advantage of everyone's talents. You know, uh, we built a system that is exclusionary, uh, you know, across so many dimensions, you know, where we miss so many opportunities, you know, to, to, to take that productive capability of, of individuals and put it to good use. We don't value the right things. Okay, we got 
We're gonna. I want. I'm holding too many people from the food truck soon, but let's let's get a few last few questions. Sorry, my, my name is Michael Galopter. I wrote a book called Lean Startups for Social Change, with a company called InfoEdge. Um, I really, I, I, I glanced at your book briefly. I've followed your stuff on this a lot. Uh, it strikes me that you have a lot of uh, great ideas about what we should be doing, which I really like. Um, and at the same time, you say that we need a revolution. So I'd love to hear, living in this area, who are the people who are actually about the rubber hitting the road, about changing those formulas? Why Combinator has a great research project on universal basic income, but there's no advice there at all about reducing, re reducing returns to investors or they'd be out of business, right? right. So there's a, in, in a lot of nice talk or you know, innovation theater in this space. Who are the best practitioners in this area? Who are the really serious corporate leaders or others who are not just t taking the great ideas you have about what should be, right, and doing the political or other kind of work to, whether it's the revolution or otherwise, to make it happen. Just, I'd love to, because I, I'd love to hear about them too. You're doing a great job in thought leadership in this space. Yeah. The question is, how do we move from great ideas to actually traction? Um, well, I guess I would say that, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I can name names. I, I, w I will say that the thing that I'm probably heartened by more than the business leaders. I feel like the economics profession is moving in the direction of saying there's something wrong with the models we've been feeding you. A and that's, uh, that's a pretty positive sign. There are a lot of um, you know, things that were once considered fringe that are now coming into the mainstream of economics. And you know, economics is where the, you know, the policymakers get their ideas from. And so that, that's actually probably the area I've, I've been most heartened by. Uh, but I'm also really heartened by, uh, you know, the walkaways. You know, uh, and uh, yeah, I mentioned this sort of crazy story from Tulsa, but you know, here's Jeff Huber from, you know, um, you know former you know, senior Google engineering manager whose wife dies of cancer. He's like, screw it. I'm gonna you know, go raise money to try to get an early detection blood test for cancer. You know, it's like, uh, he's kind of he's going, this is probably going to fail, but it's, it's worth doing, you know? And I see a lot of entrepreneurs who are walking away from that model of, I want to have a quick flip. You know, I want to do a startup that somebody will fund and that somebody else will buy, and then I'll do it again. You know, I want to I wanna stop, you know, and I, I had one entrepreneur tell me recently, you know, I'm starting a company, and it's, it's, I'm telling my investors, this is a 30, 40 year project. And I love that. You know, it's like I'm saying, I'm not going to flip this. I'm not going to walk away from this. I'm not just you know, in this game of, of trying to make money. I'm trying to make change. And I, I think you know, there are entrepreneurs all through Silicon Valley who are stepping up to that challenge. Well, I'll tell you what. There is, there's a ton of questions here. We're wrapping at the very end here. Um, just kind of building on that last one for a final question, because we've got plenty of time to chat. We're going to have a lot of food here and drinks to go. Um, if you, how open do you feel? I mean, it, it, is there anything we could do as a community here to start a different kind of dialogue? Is there any kind of um, line in the sand? Is there any kind of catalytic moment? I mean, your book is a good piece here, but I'm just trying to figure out, besides reading your book, uh -huh. besides trying to absorb the zeitgeist, is there anything that you would kind of challenge the tech community, the Bay Area, to like start doing now with an eye towards politics, an eye towards where we're going in the next three to five years here? Is there something that you see is just the missing piece at all? Or if not, that's fine too. But I'm just yeah, trying to figure out, it's like, I, I I, so I many people are craving some kind of steps forward in a more concrete way in our politics and in our, where our economy is. Is there any last thoughts I, you I, might I have on I what we could do? I don't have a lot of specific prescriptions other than look around, you know, see things that you can make better and work to make them better. You know, it's like the, 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 uh, you know, the big changes in the world are the result of a lot of small changes. And uh, I, I, you know, it's interesting, uh, Jen, uh, my wife, gave a, a, a talk about Death Star thinking, you know, the, you know, from Star Wars, you know, where it's like, yeah, there's this magic point, you know, if you can just get the, you know, the, 
proton torpedo down that little hole, you blow up the whole Death Star. Hello. And it's like there ain't no, you know, way to blow up the Death Star <laughs> with one <laughs> torpedo, you know. <laughs> and and uh, I, I think that you know we have to actually give up that thinking, and you know just do the hard work of of making the world better around us and you know, and making better choices every day. With that, let's give Tim an awesome <laughs> hand for an amazing <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Terrific. And everybody stay. There's food trucks out the back here. The drinks are open. Hang out here. And oops. No. Oh, you're not supposed to bring the alcohol outside. So if you grab your food, bring it in and drink. But otherwise, we're all around here. Meet everybody here is awesome. Connect with some folks. Learn some new folks. And we'll see you next month.